Hey readers and writers, I'm Adrian Buskey, and you're listening to Fictitious, a podcast about the storytelling craft of science fiction and fantasy. In this episode, I'm joined by Annalee Newitz, author of the sci-fi time travel novel The Future of Another Timeline. In a world where present-to-past time travel is an accepted fact, geoscientist Tess uses her university-funded temporal travels for both research and resistance. While a subversive group of travelers seeks to alter history and solidify the subjugation of women, Tess works in secret to minimize the damage of their edits and to keep them from permanently locking the timeline. But although a dire confrontation looms somewhere in the centuries around her, Tess can't keep herself from breaking time travel taboo, stepping back into her own history in an attempt to prevent a riot girl teenager named Beth's involvement in murder. The future of another timeline arrives September 24th from Tor, and Annalie, welcome to Fictitious. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to have you on the show. I did a panel with you a couple of years ago at Emerald City Comic Con. We did the 10 points to Slytherin, why good fans love evil characters. And it was it was a thrill to talk to you on that. We had a great panel and really just interesting discussion with a bunch of other writers. And uh, just a couple of months ago from back from when this is recorded, my wife did a panel with you at San Diego Comic Con, the How to Be a Nerd for a Living panel. So I've been very aware uh, beyond just your writing because people you're well known for being a founding editor of io9 and now, you know, a couple of acclaimed novels in. But I know you first and foremost as a fantastic live speaker. So getting you on the show is uh, is very, very cool. Can you kind of give me your own rundown of uh, Future of Another Timeline and kind of flesh out the, the story outside of my big flowery blurb? Sure. I actually really liked your flowery blurb. I was like, ooh, I should steal from that. <laughs> <laughs> so I usually start out by talking about the characters uh, as you did. Um, Tess is a feminist who is working with a secret group who are going outside of what their university grants allow and are trying to change the timeline, not just observe the timeline. And her path in time keeps crossing over with the life of a teenage riot girl named Beth. And Beth is stuck in time. She can't move around in time. And she's dealing with the horrors of being in high school. She has a really abusive father, and she's just trying to deal with that. And then on top of all that stuff, her best friend decides to start murdering rapists and creepers, kind of in the name of Riot Girl Revolution. And so as if that wasn't enough, now a time traveler has showed up in her life and is trying to tell her to do things. And so... The fun of the book for me as a writer and hopefully for readers is figuring out what's the relationship between Tess and Beth? Um, How does this bigger story about feminist revolution throughout the centuries connect to this pretty small story of just one girl in 1992 trying to survive high school? So um, it's kind of about the personal and the political as well as just a lot of (laughs) timey-wimey. I guess it's fair to say that people that are out there looking for agenda-free entertainment maybe aren't going to find it in this one. Everything is political. (laughs) (laughs) So even if you want, you know, time travel shenanigans, they're going to be political no matter what, especially when you're messing around with history, I think. So I'm really hard pressed to think of a time travel novel, especially that doesn't have some kind of politics to it, whether those are kind of party politics or kind of looking at um, nation states or looking at Uh, more personal issues, even something as kind of silly as the movie Time After Time, which is kind of a delightful film where H.G. Wells is going forward in time to try to stop Jack the Ripper, who's stolen his time machine. It's kind of a sweet romance, but it also has all of these political implications, um, especially about gender, actually. So no matter how silly you get, there's always a kind of a political edge. I definitely say that jokingly because I have I've encountered this kind of agenda free entertainment thing uh, occasionally. And I know there's even a few publishers that sort of like indies that sort of present themselves that way. And exactly like you said, I mean, even if you're presenting no message, which is essentially status quo, Mm -hmm. that is a stance, right? There is nothing about our life, especially right now, that isn't political. You know, any actions that you would take have a ripple effect on the people around you and greater society. And the bigger the actions, the bigger the stakes the more political that is. So yeah. um, there's kind of no way to avoid that. So yeah, I just I just kind of find it amusing. I Whenever uh, you know, I read reviews online for things, I'm always kind of waiting for that one person to come in and be like, this book preached to me about something. <laughs> yep, that's what books do, you know, and that's wonderful. And I think really the 
goal has to be to do it in a way that's fun and entertaining. So you don't feel like you're sitting in a classroom and like someone is just sort of telling you the story of history. (laughs) Right, exactly. Well, with this one, you do have the story of history going on in a lot of different eras. Um, You mentioned that Beth is living her her best alt punk riot girl life in the early 1990s. Uh, and I was a rock and roll kid in the 1990s. So uh, I feel that for sure. <laughs> and then you have Tess, who is from our future, living a fair amount of her life in the past and doing so sort of grant funded through her university work, which I thought was a really interesting thing. So I want to delve into this idea of time travel in this book, because I, as a reader and and also as a consumer of media in general, time travel stories are almost like that kind of thing that like I approach with incredible trepidation because they're hard to get right and you can have the things like the, like doctor who where it gets really hand wavy so you can just be like eh, you know what it's a mechanic but don't worry about it because it's you know it's just for fun essentially sure and then you can get into things like say like the the recent avengers movie where you know it presents its kind of own idea of multiple timelines and, and how you can use and twist those around each other you know in this particular story you have a pretty unique i, I really don't think that i've read a take on time travel quite like this one before, uh, which was really refreshing, um, but also requires a little bit of work, you know, for on the reader side to kind of get an idea of how it works. So can you kind of explain that mechanic and how this particular version of time travel functions in the story? Sure. And I just want to say that I completely agree that time travel is one of those narrative tropes that creates a lot of anxiety in me as a reader. And as a writer, I never thought I would tackle it because it's just so freaking hard. I mean, to do it well without the hand waving. I mean, I love Doctor Who. And I think part of what they do well is kind of reassure you that you don't need to worry too much about the mechanic. But I think there's just so many opportunities for plot holes. And I spent a lot of time plugging them. And I I definitely did not plug them all. Um, In fact, somebody just brought one up to me the other day that I hadn't thought of. which was, (laughs) And I was like, you know, that's just how it's going to be like, you can never be perfect. But what I really was fascinated by when I started working on this was the idea of what would happen if time travel had always existed? And what would it be like to be living in a single timeline? So kind of uh, back to the future style where we're really only in one timeline. And so if you change something, it'll change your own life and your family's life and things like that. So you aren't branching off into a million timelines which is actually, I guess, according to sort of quantum physics, it's more like we're branching into a million timelines. So we're really not in the realm of science here. We're really in the realm of kind of a literary trope. When I was coming up with my time machines, I wanted them to be the subject of discovery science, as opposed to the usual trope, which is that we've built a machine, right? So machine, the time machines are like computers, right? We built them, we know how they work. Every aspect of them is something that we control and we understand the HG Wells model. But if it's discovery science, which is like astronomy or biology, where there's something out there in the universe that we know works in a certain way, a predictable way, and we're just trying to figure it out as people or as scientists, that gives us a really different kind of time travel. So I put the time machines if they're time machines. We don't even know if they're machines. We don't even know what the heck they are. Um, (laughs) They're discovered in ancient rock formations called shield formations that form in the crust of the earth about half a billion years ago. And we do have these crustal formations all over the planet. And I planted them in five different places on the planet that really do have shield rock formations, um, including the Great Canadian Shield, uh, which is where my characters go to the Flin Flon time machine um, in Flin Flon, Manitoba. And they're discovered, you know, about 5,000 years ago, right around the time that in our world, ancient societies were first discovering astronomy and were first learning how to track the stars and name the stars and navigate by the stars. And I wanted to have a parallel with time travel and say, you know, okay, well, they've discovered this device that's in rock. And if you kind of pound on the rock, it opens a wormhole. And depending on the pattern that you pound, it can take you back really far or not very far at all. You can only go into the past. And so at first, when people discover these, they think it's magic. You know, they're entering a magical portal, basically. And over time, over thousands of years, as science develops, people start to realize, oh, I'm actually traveling through time. There's a pattern to this. I can predict where I go based on the pattern I pound on the rocks. And by the time the test comes along, and she's 
you know, living in the 2020s, uh, they have pretty sophisticated machines controlled by computers that are pounding out these really elaborate patterns on the rock to send people back to precisely the spot they want to go. And scientists have figured out some things about how these machines work. They don't have any idea where they come from. They have all kinds of weird things that they do that no one understands, like multiple people can't go through the machine at the same time. You can't go back to a time that you've already been to. They call that burning out of a time. Why that happens, how the machine is able to track who's gone where, they just don't know. And I loved doing that to my characters because that's really how science works a lot of the time is that, you know, you talk to a biologist about, for example, um, cancer type diseases we know some things about how they work and some things about how we might generate therapies for these kinds of genetic diseases. But why did they start? What's the pathway? Like, we're still figuring it out, but we're muddling through. You know, we're trying to treat these kinds of conditions, even though we don't fully understand them. We're trying to travel to other planets, even though we don't really understand how the universe works. We continue to travel forward in time, even though we don't understand how space time works. So I wanted that. I wanted that joy of thinking about science from that perspective. But from a literary perspective, I also wanted to have this idea of a timeline that's heavily edited and that everyone knows about these time machines. It's not a secret thing. There's no secret society of time travel people. Everyone knows that the timeline is edited and that everything we experience is the result of thousands and thousands of people revising history over thousands of years. And, you know, potentially even longer than that 5,000 years we know about, like there could have been people 20,000 years ago playing with time machines and who knows what they did, um, you know, in the Paleolithic with time machines. So I really liked that idea because it allows it allowed me to think about historical revisionism in a really literal way. And that's why my characters are having edit wars, because that's the language that time travelers use to talk about history, is that they're making edits and that they're uh, reverting edits because all of history is kind of, in a sense, up for grabs, um, as long as you've kind of gone through the training that, that a traveler has to go through, which is a bit arduous. So not everyone can just jump into the time machine. And that was Actually, I had to come up with that. That was one of my first plot holes that I filled. I was like, <laughs> okay, other, if everyone can do this all the time, this is going to be ridiculous. So I came up with kind of a, a mechanic for people who travel through the machines have to have been in the vicinity of a machine, like very nearby within a few kilometers of the machine for about four years um, until the machine will actually open for them and let them into the wormhole. Again, why does the machine do that? We don't know. But we do know that reliably that works. And so people who become travelers tend to be people who are either very rich and have the time and money to spend four years hanging out basically next to a time machine, um, or they're people who are in training for some kind of profession like a scientist um, or you know, a secret agent or something like that who's going to be able to be in some kind of program where they're learning a bunch of stuff while they're waiting to get their four years. I really liked that the machines themselves – the time machines, however you would re refer to them, these giant rock engine of time. Things. Yeah. <laughs> they do have these sort of arbitrary rules applied to things. And I remember like when I first got to that part in the story about the four-year wait and how it's it's sort of this cultural thing. I forget what you call it precisely in the book, but the, when people do basically have to like, well, I want to travel through time, so I've got to be in this one place for four years. Um, and it's kind of this arduous thing where they're, they're just stuck there until then time opens up behind them but i remember reading it and going oh that's clever that's a good mechanic uh, yeah. <laughs> well and it lets you kind of have each of the time machines so my characters are spending their time in flin flon because that's the nearest it's sort of the north american time machine and it allows you to have kind of a, a university campus almost that kind of springs up around the time machine and so it creates its own little cultural milieu which i imagine as partly a university town but partly a little bit a place where people are doing training for different government agencies, too. So you have to imagine there's like there's got to be NSA type agents or like, not really NSA. It would be more like CIA agents or something like that that are training to travel in time. We never meet them in the book at all. But I kind of had in the back of my mind, well, you know, people are assassinating people all the time. And like, even though 
the travelers have figured out that assassinating someone doesn't really do much good because if you assassinate Hitler, you know, some other guy comes along named Bittler or Zittler. They've already tried assassinating a bunch of people during the Napoleonic Wars. And like Napoleon is like the fifth guy to come along. And so they're like, fine, we're just going to stop trying to assassinate these sort of war leaders. We're just going to stick to doing other things. Um, And basically, that's kind of when travelers decide that changing the timeline is worthless, like that, because no matter what they do to change it, it doesn't seem like it makes a difference. But my characters believe it does. And of course, we know it does. We find out really quickly in the book that you can, in fact, change the timeline. There's a moment where this group of characters, um, Tess is part of a group called the Daughters of Harriet, who are, you know, sort of working around that same machine in Manitoba that you were talking about. And they're all traveling through time and they're all trying to make some of these positive changes as well as observations to figure out how to improve the lives of women in their timeline. But whenever they get back together and they have kind of these group meetings, one of the discussions is what does everybody remember that somebody else doesn't? I was talking with my wife about the book and trying to explain that aspect. And I was like, well, one of them was like, oh, I came back from traveling for a while. And like, you know, one day has passed here, but I've been gone for three years. And I came back and my favorite coffee chain doesn't exist anymore. They used to be all over the place and now they're not. And now there's more Starbucks than I remember from before. And that's a small change, but that was like an entire business vanished in the timeline for this person while they were gone. For somebody else, it's that their partner was sort of erased from the timeline. And the only person who remembers them is Tess, having just traveled previously. And thinking about that, I was like, that is a small change in this grand scheme of humans, right? But that's a very significant change to a group of people who have lost a friend, lost a lover, lost a family member, because that person has been somewhere else ejected from the timeline. Yeah. And that's terrifying. That idea that somebody could be plucked out of things after having lived a full life and now essentially been erased and a group of people have to sit in a room and and try to deal with how do you have grief over somebody you can't remember that one member can say, oh, no, this was our friend and now they're gone. Can you kind of tell me about like the group, the Daughters of Harriet? And then I think that will open up kind of our discussion of who sort of the villains of the piece are. So the Daughters of Harriet take their name from the great Senator Harriet Tubman, who is elected in 1880. And as I said, this is an edited timeline. So that means this is an alternate timeline that the characters live in. And there's a couple of big differences for these characters. They're not maybe big differences in the grand scheme of um, alternate history. And part of what I wanted to do with this book was kind of tweak the idea of what alternate history could be. And so instead of having a war be won or lost by a different great power, one of the main differences in this world is that in the United States, women got the vote at the same time as freed slaves. And that really changes a lot in terms of women's lives, obviously, but it also changes political resistance. It prevents there from being a wedge driven immediately between women and freed slaves who had been working together to get the vote uh, until in our timeline, until freed male slaves were given the vote and then women were not. Um, So they're given the vote. And as a result, Harriet Tubman is elected senator, which many historians believe she would have been because she was a war hero. She was an incredibly famous speaker. She was very well known, very beloved. She would have been a perfect person for the Republican Party to run. Uh, Because remember, back in the 19th century, the Republicans were the party of um, of abolitionism, and they were they were Lincoln's party. So all of the early black congressmen were run on the Republican ticket. So so she becomes a great leader and um, she's really um, improved the timeline for women. And she has also, Harriet Tubman has suggested in her writing and in her speaking that the point of time travel is to change the timeline. And so the daughters of Harriet have taken this to heart and they're all academic feminists who are geologists because geology is the field of time travel because these machines are made of rock. And they are secretly carrying out what they think Harriet Tubman would have wanted, which is expanding the rights of women. And in the process of doing that, each time someone travels back in time, if they make an edit, that person is really the only person who remembers the previous timeline, which is why when the daughters of Harriet get together, one of their rituals is to say, 
what do you remember about history? And each of them tells the story of what they remember about history, which, again, this isn't so far off from how all of us experience history anyway. And I think that right now we're at a period in the United States where we're kind of realizing that depending on where you've come from, you might remember a very different history. And I think that's what's been interesting about a lot of the journalism coming out of the New York Times and other places about thinking about the origins of slavery in the United States and thinking about that history and how black history in the States is very different from white history, which is sort of taught as mainstream normal history. And that that there really are two different kinds of memory at work that need to be unified before the nation can really function. And so when the women get together, the women and non-binary people get together at um, the Daughters of Harriet, they're kind of sharing all these different histories. And some of them keep some of those histories to themselves because the histories they remember are so horrifying that they don't want their sisters to know what it could have been like. And so we have kind of different degrees of sharing um, and so, yeah, so I'm not sure if I answered your question. <laughs> <laughs> I got so excited talking about time travel. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, there is a thing where it feels almost like the, um, I think it's called the Mandela effect. And we have it in, in our real world where people have different memories of things where they swear up and down. There's a whole contingent of people who believe that the Berenstein Bears title is spelled this particular way and they know they saw it this way their entire lives. And there's <laughs> literally thousands of people who feel that. Yes. And then there's a whole bunch of people who remember a particular film uh, called Shazam with Shaq playing a, a genie. And I swear to you, I am one of those people. Like it is mm-hmm. in it, in my mind, like that is a thing that exists. And then when people pointed out this doesn't exist, I was like, "What?" I remember watching that when I was a kid. Yeah, it's like in um, the famous uh, Kurosawa movie Rashomon. It, people call it the Rashomon effect because that's a movie where uh, different people who've been witness to a crime each describe the crime, and they all have different memories of it. And and of course, you know, law enforcement officers know this too that when you're getting witnesses to a crime. Sometimes one person remembers the car is red, someone else remembers the car is purple, and it's just, it is how memory works. And so that was, again, part of the fun for me in in having this version of time travel was kind of trying to pluck at some of those real life feelings that we have around memory and whether it's personal memory or it's kind of collective historical memory of our nation, those memories can be really different and what's important is that we get together and share those memories and kind of figure out, okay, what really happened based on how all of us remember it? And that's part of what the Daughters of Harriet do. And of course, part of what they do is they make new history and they go back and try to change things. And so Tess, who is our main character, she is very interested in making sure that women have reproductive rights. And the other thing that's really different about this timeline, well, not so different about this timeline, (laughs) is that uh, in the United States, um, women do not have the right to get an abortion anywhere in the country. And this has led to kind of personal tragedy for some of the characters and also just collective horror for a lot of women and or a lot of people who um, have uteruses. And so Tess has decided, and I think rightly, that one way to edit this uh, out of the timeline, to edit this um, law against uh, abortion out of the timeline is to go back to the late 19th century and to try to ruin the career of Anthony Comstock, who is a real life guy who was a moral activist in the 19th century. He came from New York. He started his career with the formerly activist litigation organization, the YMCA, which was a group that now we think of as just like, it's a fun place to go exercise. But at the in the 19th century, They um, were actively litigating uh, against what they considered to be obscenity, which included things like information about birth control and abortion. And then Anthony, our pal Anthony, founded the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice, uh, which he led for a couple of decades. And they did the same thing. They engaged in litigation and they also engaged in um, lobbying in Congress. And so Anthony Comstock had a lot of friends in Congress and managed to get the Comstock laws passed. I mean, we call them the Comstock laws now. They were the obscenity laws that basically governed definitions of what was obscene and therefore illegal 
in the mail from the late 19th century all the way up until, in some cases, the 1980s. And I think there's still some Comstock laws that are on the books. And so the famous kind of cases around obscenity law that that we read about now, like in the 1960s and 70s, were in fact overturning a lot of these Comstock laws. And in those laws, not only was pornography dubbed obscene with a very capacious definition, but also information about birth control and information about abortion. So women could just simply not get access to that information uh, without going to jail. And so Comstock's other big thing was he loved to arrest women who were giving out information about birth control and conducting abortions in the 19th century. And his he liked to brag in his public speeches that he'd driven you know, a dozen women to suicide because they had been arrested for their work doing abortions and handing out birth control. And indeed, it was true. He had driven a number of women to suicide, including Ida Craddock, who uh, there's a character in the novel who's kind of loosely based on Ida, um, who was a spiritualist in Chicago. So anyway, so Tess goes back to tangle with Comstock, who is going to make an appearance at the Chicago World's Fair. And so that's part of her plot is to figure out how can she meet the right people to take down this guy who has destroyed the lives of so many women and whose laws will destroy the lives of so many more women after he's gone? Like he's had such an outsized effect on history. He's he's really done a good edit um, without even being a time traveler. So um, uh, on Comstock's side, there's a group of men's rights activist time travelers called the Comstockers who are working against Tess and her group. And so they meet all across the timeline, but mostly at the World's Fair, where there's a lot of revolutionary belly dancers, which was a really fun thing to write about just in general, because belly dancing is amazing. And I love the idea of having riot girls in 1992 and belly dancers in 1893, kind of like connected across the timeline without realizing it. So anyway, a lot of the action is literally just time travel, like timey-wimey stuff, where it's like, there's the bad guys, and we've spotted them, like, you know, thousands of years ago, and here's the good guys, and they're kind of running around and doing stuff. But they also, in order to do historical edits, in order to do edits to the timeline, you know, you can't just shoot Hitler. Like I said, you can't just shoot Anthony Comstock. They really have to foment a social movement against Anthony Comstock. And so that's really the action of the book is like, how do you get enough allies together? How do you start a social movement or maintain a social movement that will actually allow an edit to be made? Like, at what point do you have enough kind of political will that the timeline is edited? And so that's what they're constantly trying to figure out. And um, that's what I'm trying to figure out. (laughs) So that was what was fun about the book. There's a lot of historical elements to this. Like you said, I mean, these common stock and, and some of these other people are either were real people or inspired by it. I mean, you've got a lot of the story takes place around the Chicago World's Fair and uh, it, like a lot of the the social experiences that were happening there. And then, again, it's time travel. So you have that and you have stories in the 1990s. You have stories in the 2020s and scenes in these different places. So you've got a lot of ground to cover. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what was the research like going into kind of putting all this together? Because, again, I, mean, I mentioned earlier, but I mean, you're you're well known as the founding editor of io9. So you have a you know a grounding in science and political science thinking and like how those things like wrap around each other with story. But um, how did that background inform your storytelling here? And then, yeah, like what kind of research did it take to put this all together? Yeah, it was a lot. Um, in fact, I mean, the research kept ballooning um, as the book went on. Um, I started out thinking oh, I'm going to just do really um, scientifically accurate time travel. Like that was going to be how I did it. So I talked to a couple of physicists, um, Adam Becker and Sean Carroll. And actually, Sean Carroll has a book that just came out, um, which is about kind of the origin of space time. And um, they both very kindly and gently said, no, time travel is not real. (laughs) It is not a thing that science can give you. <laughs> so, and I think Adam said, um, you know, it's it's not a scientific device, it's a literary device. And then Sean talked me through very kindly, like a couple of different ways that I could do time travel that would be kind of in line with science. Like, first of all, he said, go ahead and use wormholes. That's fine, whatever. Nobody really knows what those are. So <laughs> sure, have some wormholes. There you go. 
Um, but we also talked a lot about, you know, stuff that comes up in the book that I won't go into too much because it's actually really fun to see it unfolding in the book, but just sort of how how scientists would think about these phenomena if they were observing them, if they saw, oh, people are traveling back in time, the kinds of ways that they would theorize that with the physics as we know it now, right? So, and then, and of course, we invented like another type of physical force in the universe that they might be looking at or looking for. And then, you know, really almost all of the other research, other than the kind of geology stuff, was historical. And I kind of went, overboard. And a lot of it didn't make it into the book. Like I did so much research on the World's Fair and belly dancing and the history of belly dancing. And I like realistic constraints in books. And so one of the things that really obsessed me was, you know, the time machine is located in in Flin Flon, which is in kind of northern Manitoba. And if you went back to the 19th century, it's really hard to get to Flin Flon. And in fact, this time machine, the Flin Flon time machine is only discovered kind of as as um, Europeans are mining in the area. So it's discovered in like kind of the late 19th century. So there's no like roads. So I had to figure out based on maps of the time how Tess would have gotten, basically she takes a canoe down a river to get to a train station in Winnipeg and then has to get from there to Chicago. And so I looked at train maps of the era and things like how much it would cost to live in Chicago in 1893 and like how much a woman could expect to make if she was working as a seamstress, which Tess winds up doing. Like I said, I was a little obsessed. I read a lot about anarchist history in Chicago, which was quite profound. I mean, Chicago was kind of a hotbed of, of anarchism. So there's a lot of real people. Um, I kind of dramatized this actual kind of just shitty Twitter style debate that happened between um, Emma Goldman, who is a famous New York anarchist, and Lucy Parsons, who was a Chicago anarchist. And they got into this really horrible debate, I think in the 1880s, where they were just, you know, it was like internecine debates that we have now within feminism, basically. And it's just as terrible as the debates we we have now and just as kind of harmful to the movement. But I loved being able to kind of call on real life history. And I even when I was researching Anthony Comstock, I actually I read a bunch of his writing and I took direct quotes from some of his writing and and put them in the mouth of the Anthony Comstock character. And I also have the character who's kind of based on Ida Craddock says a couple of things that are taken from Ida Craddock's work. And there's also, there's just a lot of stuff. Like if you're a geoscientist and you're really interested in the Ordovician period, (laughs) there's a lot of like Ordovician period detail that's really specific. Um, So, you know, I found that a lot of people I know when they're writing fiction, they say, oh, I like to go off to a place where there's no internet um, because then I'm not interrupted. And I was like, I literally can't do my work without the internet because I'm constantly <laughs> looking things up. And um, and that's, to me, it's really fun. It's probably because I have this background in journalism, but it did mean that there's a lot of stuff that's historically accurate in the book that like no one will care about except for me, which is fine. It's, it's fine. But <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps I did more research than I need to. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> When you're trying to deliver that much exposition, that much detail, like you said, I mean, you have to be judicious about what ends up in there. It's a pretty normal kind of approach for a lot of writers dealing with any kind of period piece or anything that requires research that there's, you know, 60% of the research never arrives in the final cut of the book. And that's okay sure. because it informs your thinking. And the more you understand it, the better you can explain those things to the audience. But in a work of fiction, Giving that information can sometimes slow the narrative, cause things to get clunky, can cause problems with just, you know, the overall pacing of a story. So what was your approach in delivering that information and trying to keep the flow of the story going, making sure as you switch back and forth between these two POVs from Tess to Beth, you know, that you don't get lost in trying to like fill in so much of this information so the audience can keep track of what's going on and understand the context of those scenes? Yeah, it's a really good question. I'm still not sure I'm completely satisfied with how I dealt with it in the book, because I think that was ultimately the hardest part of writing it was 
trying to do world building that felt fun and organic to the story and felt like it was something where it was secondary to the characters. Because obviously the characters are what's really pulling me into the story and pulling readers into the story. And I didn't ever want to have a moment where there was just a chapter that was like, well, and this is how time travel works. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I think to a certain extent, there kind of are moments when the story had to slow down because, as you said, this is a different kind of time travel. It's not like it's an easy thing to explain. And I think what I wound up doing was, um, in revision, a big part of what I was doing was spreading out the explanations across the book. One of my models for doing that is William Gibson, who often, in his work, kind of starts the novel by plunging you into a very strange and unexplained world that may have words for things that you don't understand, or there may be like social um, norms that are not explained. And, you know, often Gibson will wait until really late in the story. And part of the fun of a Gibson novel is almost like, what is all this shit that I'm <laughs> reading about? Okay, oh, now I get it. And so I definitely... There's a lot of stuff that you find out as the book goes along. And like part of the pleasure of reading it is learning more and more about how time travel works, um, learning more about different periods of time that they visit. Like I said, I'm still not sure that I'm totally happy with it. I think it's still, you know, there's definitely a couple moments where characters just have conversations like and I kind of I have one moment kind of late in the novel where one of the time travelers who's a professor at UCLA is talking to Beth, who's finally made it out of high school and gone to UCLA. And Beth is like thinking of studying. She wants to study geology. And she's like, I just don't understand how the hell these time machines work. Like, it doesn't make any sense to me. And they have a whole conversation about it where uh, this professor explains it. And it's not it's not like the first episode of Dear White People in the third season where they kind of joke about this guy saying like, and here's a bunch of stuff on this chalkboard and here's how all of history works. Like, it's not like that. <laughs> I hope that it's an engaging scene because it's also a scene where we learn a lot about both of those characters and um, both of them are characters we've gotten to know throughout the book. But it's definitely like this moment where it's like, okay, and now allow Annalie to explain like, <laughs> how does time travel work? So yeah, I mean it's it's a toughie, and um, I hope I hope that it worked out well, and I hope that people find it fun as well as kind of like, occasionally slightly info dumpy. In a recent episode, I was having a conversation with Alex E. Harrow about her book, The Ten Thousand Doors of January, and we were talking about the whole rule of show don't tell in fiction. Yes. And she made the point uh, with her book was that at a certain point, there were moments where it made more sense to just tell. You know, obviously not just a straight like, now the narrator will tell you what's going on here. But in the sense that like to show it would take so much time of really extrapolating out in a long, drawn out way for a scene to express some of these big cultural things or big uh, ex expository things when the narrator or a person in conversation could just kind of lampshade it, you know, just say, okay, here it is. Yeah, yeah here's how it works. <laughs> yeah, and I think that, you know, it's like all writing rules, show don't tell is is a very useful tool, but not necessarily a hard and fast one, because sometimes you do just need to do things in their most functional, efficient manner, so that you can move on with the tale. And so I think that is that it's a challenge of figuring out how to when you do need to tell how to do it well and make it work. And like you said, integrating it into dialogue. I mean, we see that happen in film all the time. And sometimes it's clunky and sometimes uh, it's it happens so that we don't even know it until we watch a YouTube video where somebody says, and now they tell us the backstory. And you're like, oh, yeah, yeah that's what happened. But yeah, it's I mean, it's a challenge to make that work. And yeah, like, like you said, I mean, sometimes like when you've got this much stuff happening in a book. And it's not a huge book. You know, this isn't like a Brandon Sanderson doorstopper. No, it's not an epic journey. It's <laughs> it's a very <laughs> short epic journey. Yeah, I mean, I think that's such an interesting point about how sometimes you have to tell and not show. And there's definitely parts of this book that reflect the fact that I really enjoy, as a journalist, I really enjoy sitting down with scientists and being told stuff. And so there's a couple scenes, like I said, where this where where Beth goes and talks to her professor. And that's totally 
I don't know if that can be called a Mary Sue moment because it's it's like as it, this this brief Mary Sue moment where it's like, oh, I just get to ask this professor everything I want to know, which is a really good feeling. And then there's another scene in the book which I don't want to give away too much, but we know that Beth has this really troubled, um, abusive father. And we know that there's something that's happened in her family in the past, and we don't know what it is. And finally, um, we do find out. And I thought about it a lot, like, how do I want to present that scene? I could have shown it. It would have come across very dark. Or I could have had what I did do, which is I have the character of Beth tell it and tell her her boyfriend, who's also kind of become her best friend, what happened to her. And I really, like, I thought about that a lot. Like, how will I make the scene feel emotionally important, but also not feel like I'm recreating the abuse that this character has endured? So I chose to have her tell it. And I think it works. It definitely worked for me. And I felt like it was true to how that character was dealing with it, because she was dealing with it by finally telling somebody what happened. I guess my point is I think that sometimes telling can be more powerful than showing, depending on the context. Well, and certainly in an era where part of the social conversation is believing women when they explain the things that they've gone through, showing will give you the explicit here is the thing. But letting the character say in their own words, this is what I experienced. This is my trauma. This is my life. Now you have to deal with my perspective of what that is and how it affects me and how I perceive it. Um, I think that's a that's a powerful choice on its own. And I think it's a relevant choice, particularly given the time period of when this is arriving. Yeah, that's true. I hadn't thought of it but that that way. But yes, I'm just going to pretend like I was totally thinking that. <laughs> <laughs> the after the fact revelations are always just really handy. that right? in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, what's your outlining process? How did you approach the actual writing process of this? I'm an outliner. So I'm not a super rigorous, like I'm not rigorous, but I'm not a super um, detailed outliner. But I definitely um, knew I had an arc in mind. I mean, it's time travel. So if you don't have an arc, you're going to be really screwed by the end. I I mean, I'm sure there's other people who do it differently and their books are amazing. But for me, (laughs) I needed to know what was going to happen. And there's a twist or a couple of twists, and I knew where I wanted those to happen. And there's a couple of characters who kind of arrive in the middle of the book, and I knew where they had to fit in. And so, um, so I did a chapter by chapter outline with these major beats. And then about halfway through, I kind of revisited that outline and refined it. So the second half of the book kind of became clearer to me, I, I find this happened with my previous novel, Autonomous as well, that like, when I got it to about the halfway point, I was like, oh, this is what I'm writing about. OK, <laughs> now I know what the next half of the novel really needs to do. So, yeah, so it's an ever changing outline. But when I'm writing, I always have that outline kind of in the document. And so as I'm writing, I can kind of scroll down and be like, OK, wait, where? OK, good. OK, I'm at this right spot, you know, so. I, I like that you you said that you kind of have to discover what you're trying to say, because I think that for a lot of people approaching story particularly if there's some major thematics you're going after, even down to something like a blog post. I mean, I find a lot that as I'm writing something that I don't necessarily know the real meat of what I'm trying to communicate until I'm kind of halfway through writing it. And then I have to look back at the previous section of it and go, oh, oh, okay. Now I need to refine this because now I've really figured it out. Yeah. It's a difference between just running your mouth, uh, you know, in conversation and then sitting in and really thinking about what you feel and how you feel and why you feel something. Same thing with story trying to figure out like, what is this trying to convey? And then learning who your characters are on the page through the writing. So um, I like that you you brought that up. Did you have a specific plotting method? Mostly my plotting method is using an outline. So I don't have like, I didn't think of it as having like a three act structure, which it might have or a five act structure or whatever, however many acts. Like I said, you can maybe box it into that. Uh, but I definitely, I knew from the start what I wanted the plot to look like and kind of what the pacing would be. And so I feel like it was probably a little bit like breaking story on a TV show or something like that, where I was like, okay, I know what the beats are and I just have to kind of get there. There were maybe like four or five scenes that I had in my head that I was like, absolutely, this scene is going to happen. I am writing toward that scene. And, and those scenes are all in there. So I didn't take out any of those scenes that I originally intended to have. I 
think. Well, in this version of history, <laughs> they're all in there. <laughs> and uh, what are what's your tools of the trade? What software do you use? Um, do you use any other kind of analog implements to aid your writing? Well, um, I use for research, I use Evernote. Um, I am totally an Evernote addict, which is kind of tragic because Evernote has become harder and harder to use and is a bit unwieldy, but it's a great tool. And I have two, I have two books in there now that I've researched and I do take notes in Evernote too. Like sometimes if I like out on a walk, I'll just like pop open an Evernote note and, and write something down. But this book I wrote in Google docs and I'd started out thinking like, Oh, I'm going to write it in, you know, Microsoft word and, or some other type of word program. And it's just, I go so many places and I use my laptop way more often than I use my desktop computer. So I just, it was just easier to use Google Docs and because I could just, as long as I had internet and even if I didn't, because you can do offline with Google Docs now. And so I would just for safety and also just for um, kind of remembering where I'd come from, I would kind of, I would work on it for a couple of months and then I would I would start a new document. And so I have like maybe 10 documents with different dates on them that are kind of different versions of the book as it was going along. And then each revision was its own document. So I kind of have a little history. Um, and of course, Google Docs does preserve revisions, so which is actually really nice. Um, so you can revert, just as you can revert the timeline, um, you can revert your document. So um, yeah, so I've been using that. And I do take a lot of notes in notebooks, but usually just from research. So like if I'm interviewing someone or, you know, doing kind of research stuff, I'll take um, handwritten notes um, and I'll use my recorder and stuff like that, just like an MP3 recorder. And um, yeah, I really like pins with like a super fine point. <laughs> so <laughs> that's actually a thing. Um, so yeah. Those are my tools. I think every person who spends any great amount of time writing starts to get an affinity for a pen or, you know, an implement of some kind. <laughs> I mean, I write in chicken scratch, but I go through stretches where I do a lot of analog writing. And when I do, I have a favorite pen brand that I'll get frustrated if I can't find it in my stuff. And be like, mm -hmm. I know I just bought five of these. Why do I not have one nearby? And I'll get super OCD about it. But yeah, but yeah I mean, it's like when you've got what you like and it works, you that level of comfort is just something that makes it easier to get right into the writing. Yeah, no, it's true. And uh, in whatever free time that you have, what other media are you consuming? Well, when I was working on Future of Another Timeline, a couple of TV shows that kind of percolated into my brain were the sadly short-lived series Sweet Vicious, which is about, uh, it was like an MTV show. Um, and it was about two college students, um, one of whom had been raped, who became vigilantes on campus and would go beat up guys who were known rapists who hadn't been brought to justice. And it was like, one of them is this super sort of mainstream idea of beauty sorority girl, and she's the one who's been raped. And so, but she's secretly a ninja. And the other one is this kind of stoner rebel who you would kind of expect would be the person who would do this kind of thing. And she's just in awe of this amazing sorority girl ninja. Um, and she's kind of a hacker too. And so they team up and it's just a really weird show. Um, and I, I was like, wow, if this can exist in the world, my book can exist. <laughs> um, and also um, the show Harlots, which is on Hulu uh, like my book, uh, it was a historical, it is still a historical drama. They just finished season three, which I think is the last season. And it's about a brothel in um, 18th century London. And the historical details are, a lot of them are pretty accurate. And one of the things I liked about Harlots was it has a very diverse cast and it really acknowledges how racially diverse um, London would have been in the 18th century. Like often when we see 18th century London, it's like, look, it's all these white people. And it's like, that's not what London was. Like there's like lots of Africans and Chinese and all kinds of people from all kinds of different places. It was a global city. So that's really um, delightful. Plus it's like women who were sex workers being super tough and amazing. And that's like a big topic that I enjoy. Um, so those were things that kind of were in my head, you know, as well as all kinds of really important feminist time travel novels like um, Marge Piercy's Woman on the Edge of Time and Joanna Russ's novel, The Female Man, um, were like uppermost in my mind. And Lauren Bucas's novel, The Shining Girls, which is amazing. And 
I'm like in awe of her ability to do time travel plotting. Like she's definitely the master <laughs> and I, I could only, only aspire to be there. And then, so that's like the kind of stuff that like mixed into to my novel. And then the things I'm reading now, just as much as I can all the time, <laughs> you know, like I'm a big fan of um, Kelly Robeson's uh, novella, God's Monsters and the Lucky Peach, which also has a lot of time travel bureaucracy in it. So she and I are very much on the same page about like how you would have to get grants in order to do time travel. She fit time travel bureaucracy into a novella? Uh, yeah, well, it's actually it's government bureaucracy related to getting funding to do a time travel expedition. And yeah, she you know, I mean, it's not, you know, that's not the main part of the, the novella. I mean, right, the novella right. is, it's a time travel story and it deals with a lot of other issues. But yeah, no, she she and I actually had a long conversation about it when um, she was working on it. And we were both like, yeah, obviously you would have to get funding. And like, how would you do it? And so I really love that. I'm a big fan of Tade Thompson's soon to be trilogy, I think, which starts with Rosewater and Insurrection. It's so good. Yeah, so amazing. It's a it's kind of an alien technology comes to earth story set in Nigeria outside Lagos. And um, it's just amazing and weird and really delightful. And gosh, what else am I reading? I'm reading a million things. I'm also reading a lot of history because I'm, I'm working on a nonfiction book about um, ancient cities. And so um, I'm reading a lot of articles about the demise of, of ancient cities. So <laughs> I will not list those for you here. But suffice <laughs> to say, there would be a lot of telling and not showing. <laughs> There'll be a fine bibliography to catch up on all of that afterwards, yes, right? Yes, <laughs> there will be. That is part of the part of the, the sadness of nonfiction is the bibliography. It's always a, a rough time there. <laughs> well, the future of another timeline arrives in stores on September 24th. It's already getting a lot of attention. Um, no big surprise uh, after how uh, Autonomous was received and considering the quality of the craft on display here. And again, just like I said, like time travel approach in a way I had not seen done before. And it's still very much character first uh, mechanics afterwards, but the uh, the way the world works and the way that it functions and even down to just uh, there's a scene in it where the high school girls are talking about something random and one mentions, oh, I think that was that was an edit, you know, <laughs> like throws yeah. that out because they just know that time travel is part of the world, which for me is the how would you go about every day thinking about, I don't know, maybe this life wasn't like this yesterday and it's already been edited and I don't know. Mm -hmm. Those are big things to uh, take on and big, uh, heavy concepts. And like you mentioned, Toddy Thompson's uh, Rosewater is another one of those like challenging science fiction books that makes you think and makes you reassess things. And I think that's one of the most powerful functions of science fiction is to make us uh, examine our uh, assumptions and our understanding of the world through a different lens. And so along with entertainment, uh, we can expand our worldview with it. And I think that this book is definitely uh, a very powerful testament to that. Oh, well, thank you so much. Yeah. So like I said, again, September 24th, uh, out in the world, the future of another timeline. And Emily, thank you for joining me on Fictitious. Thanks so much for having me. This has been Season 4, Episode 11 of Fictitious. Every episode of the show is available at FictitiousPodcast.com, along with news and events, articles, and more. Listen and subscribe to Fictitious on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify, or search for the show using your favorite app. Get connected on Twitter or Instagram, where you'll find us as at FictitiousPod. You can also chat with me about storytelling, media, fandom, or anything else on my personal account, at Adrian Buskey. If you enjoy Fictitious, please share this episode on your favorite social network, tell your book-loving friends, or write us a review. It all supports the authors who appear on the show, and you'll help me to grow the podcast. Next week, I'm joined by Clay McLeod Chapman, author of the metafictional supernatural thriller The Remaking. Subscribe now so you don't miss it. I'm Adrian Buskey. Thanks for listening to Fictitious. 